Hey, Paul, brilliant scenes in uh, Leperstown. The first race of, uh, sorry, the first race on day two of the Dublin Racing Festival. Heaven help us. You only train what two horses. You land your biggest part of your career as a trainer. Unbelievable, Kevin. It was amazing. It was great crack. Myself and Martin Lanny. Martin leads her up. And, um, you know, it's amazing the connection that Martin has with him. Martin's a master farrier himself. Now, he's, he trains greyhounds as well. Mostly he's back as bothering him, I think. Well, that's what he's telling me anyway. But the connection with her goes back to when we had the mother. And Martin picked out her mother in the sales from me back in the day. And um, we had when she was, as a broodmare then, Martin used to say to me, you know, a great horse for her would be Yates. And that's the truth. And we went off and covered her with Yates. And heaven help us is the, the foal that came from that coupling, you know. And she couldn't ask for better, really, you know, in fairness. And Paul, we were standing out on the track. Uh, I think it was myself and Gordon. And uh, there was four or five of us standing out there. And we were just drawn to yourself and Martin on the run up to the line. You were, you got so ecstatic and emotional. It was, it was brilliant to see it. I hope we have some footage because uh, it's definitely worth showing again. I was, there was a lady here the other day, I was, and she was collecting her son. We were just passing here, and she jumped out of the car and she started imitating the way I was doing the jump. And I tell you now, it's 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 a grand, it was great in the moment. I wasn't aware that I was carrying on like that, you know, which I suppose none of us are. But, it was massive excitement. I mean, you know, for us to get that level to even, you've only got one dart to throw, as I say, and it hit the bullseye. And for her to do it, it's just wonderful because like, she's been amazing. We've had great sport with her. She won her bumper in that and it was a great thrill. She came along then and, we, and her maiden hurl. And um, like we ran her in all the best races we could find. I ran her in a bumper in Ballon Road first time out. And she was beaten about 10 lengths by Gypsy last. You know, a really good mare. She's an airplane. So anyway, I'm reading the report the following day. And Peter Fahey was training and he says, I'm going to go for the listed mayor's bumper in Gordon, right? Of course, I'm going to go there as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, and that was, <laughs> there's no logic behind it at all. The bigger the race, the better the crack. That was my attitude. And that is my attitude. And uh, after that, then we went to the Dublin Racing Festival in the big mayor's race as well. Ran her in that, and we were delighted. I think she finished fifth in it or whatever. But anyway, she won her bumper in that, and, and um, we came back then to go over hurdles. And John Turner, who owns her, said to me, he says, I wonder, he says, with heaven help us, he says, do you want to train her for her novice hurdle season, or should we give her to Willie? Right? And I just said to him, I've been told to get lost by an awful lot of people in an awful lot of ways. But I said, that's the nicest way I've ever been told to... Get, get lost if you know what I mean so anyway we decided we'd give her a run in the maiden herd in Cheltenham just for the crack because he lives near Cheltenham we'd go over for the weekend get a few days have a weekend out she'd have a run around Cheltenham if Willie was going to bring her back to it at a later stage she would have had a spin around and everything was happy done you know what I mean like, so anyway that was the plan and I rang Danny Danny Mullins and said Danny we better brush up or act a small but this one's going to Cheltenham next time out for a maiden hurl and we went down to Turles or Tipperary sorry for a school in hurl and she did well in that she jumped I think the last with a couple of gardens and Danny was happy out so off we went to Cheltenham anyway and sure she won a 33 to 1 which was madness you know but no one ever thought it would happen and after she won John just said to me I think Z you better hold on to her yourself so um, and that was it and that's how it happened and we went to I was waiting for the Muck Spa Hill one day, and my phone went beep, beep, and these fancy entries for the big grade one hurl above in Leperstown at Christmas. So I'm going, well, so, you know, after winning the maiden hurl in Cheltenham, we just hit the button and say, we might as well go into it anyway and see what happens. And when the entries came out, right, there was about 28 entries, and she was the only filly in it. I said, this, I said, like, I must look a right Egypt now up here with this one in this race, and the whole turn, no, nobody else put a filly into it. I said it probably wasn't the thing to be doing. But anyway, as the race, the numbers came down, obviously, and when we declared them, she went down and she finished second in it, Abracadabra. So, I mean, that was amazing, too. I mean, she turned for home that day in front. I didn't even know what was happening at that stage. I just couldn't believe what I was looking at. And that race was the race that we planned running in Paddy Mullins' race. Then we used the same similar tactics, and Richie Condon gave her a great ride. I asked him, did he watch the race that Sean Flanagan rode? And he said he did. And that was the plan that we had. We stick with that, and if that was good enough, then with his seven pound claim, 
we thought we had a firing chance and she was in great form. So that's how it worked out. And am I right saying her four or five runs prior to winning the hurdle at uh, Leperstown were over fences, Paul? Yeah, well, you see, at the start of the season, she was rated, I don't know, it was about what, whatever it is, over hurdles, 126 or 127. And we're working her one day in the ring. And Danny said to me, I hadn't considered fences with her because, in fairness, she hasn't really got a chase in pedigree. She's off the Midlayer line, you know what I mean? Um, Trusted the trail and all that kind of thing. They're in the family, you know what I mean? Trusted partner. So, um, and then he said to me, did you consider going the fencing route? And then I said to him, yes, that's handy, like, because you can go down the beginner's chase, you see, and you're back to square one. You know, you're not taking on, say, 130 rated horses straight off. So I thought it was a good idea. And we went to Sligo and walked into a, a real good mayor of Henry de Bromhead's. Um, Rob Court, I can't remember her name now, but she beat his handy. But anyway, the next day she ran, then she ran in Fairy House and David wrote her and she jumped like a book. Then he was injured or suspended or something and David wrote her and she won. And um, then we ran her in a race. I tell you, it was a better race now than I read a paper. I wasn't sure. You see, you're learning as you're going along. There was a rated novice chase, right? In the ne her next outing. And I ran her in that. Um, not knowing what rating she get. And I was wondering, would she get her a 125? And the handicapper let her into this. And if her horse is rated 120, she might have been rated 126. But he, he allowed her run in the race. And I thought that was good of him, right? <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> Uh, when I got into the race, I'm going, oh, geez, this wasn't so clever. I was given, you know, four pounds to horses. And that good horse of, um, oh, he won yesterday. Do you know what Farmix? Far Farmix, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he won the race, right? And she was beaten about five lengths. And I said to myself, no, that was a good run, but I was stupid. I felt I was stupid anyway, running in the race. That if I met him in a normal race the next time, he'd have to give me seven. So I'd be 11 pounds better off. So I felt like a right um, gobsheen for running her in that race. But like it was a good line of farm and he won well yesterday now. So, you know, but then I ran her in Cork and she didn't run so good and she wasn't jumping the fences and she wouldn't go into the fences like, you know, the way she wouldn't attack him. And um, that was it. Then I decided, I think, myself that maybe we'll go back to the hurdles with her. Um, so I don't, that was simple enough. We went up to the corner then and... Richie scolded her over the hurls, and each time he went up over the hurls, she got lower over them and happier. If she was delighted with herself coming down from the corner after the jump in the hurls, she was in great form. I said to Richie, When you jump off on Sunday, let her see her hurls, keep her out and let her see what's going on. Don't cover her up. And the rest is history. So he gave her a peach in fairness to him. And how did you think? How, were, were you confident? Uh, were you expecting a performance like that? Or were you we were hoping open. going to Leperstown that she was going to be competitive and finishing the first five, maybe? Yeah, no, she was in some farm now, Kevin. I mean, you know, it was easy talk three days before the event. You're right, lads. We were going to, we were going up there to do a job. You know, we were, honest to God, the ferry overseer on putting shoes on, and he was saying to the lad, be all Willie and Gordon says, I'll tell you one thing again, this one bet, they know all about it. And that was course now on maybe Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a right lad. But maybe Saturday now I wasn't so brave. And definitely Sunday morning I wasn't I was trying to be brave in front of Richie because I said to him if you Richie lives in Paulstown you see and I said she if I come over and collect the colours on Sunday morning and say me walking from the stable yard up to the you know in Leperstown like it's a long walk for an old like me like and I said <laughs> it'll save me having to walk up right and I was trying to be real positive in front of Richie on Sunday morning it wasn't easy let me tell you I was there saying Richie you know what your claim and if she improves like we could be 10 pound well in here you know, so let her rip and give it a go. And in fairness to him, he did, he did a great job. And, and she, it was brilliant. Yeah. I just and you you just needed the line, because Joseph O'Brien's filly was another strange she didn't change you. Uh, what, what was your emotion when she went by the line in front, when she just held that? We were fine when we turned in. When I saw her, you know what I mean? At the third bit, we say, at the third bit, coming out of the back straight in Leverstown, right? The plan was to start going on. If she was able to go, go from there. And if you jumped the second last, I said, don't sit, drive on. So she won't quicken, but she stay going. So we were more than then coming down to the last. She was gone two or three clear. Next thing Joseph starts to come to that. And I'm going, oh my God. I said to myself, imagine being in front of all this way and all this way and getting nailed. Because I said, I'm never going to get this kind of a chance again. So that was when I leaned forward, <laughs> watching the line to make sure that she was up. Because 
I've had a fair amount of experience of being beaten short heads and winning short heads in the Greyhound game. So, um, yeah, it was massive because like to do that again, Kevin, you know, the chances of it happening are very, very slim, you know. But and for you to win, for you to win the race that was run in memory of Paddy Mullins, that mm-hmm. meant even more to you. That was massive because when I saw that race even advertised last year, I just said to myself, she was a novice last year. I said, wouldn't it be lovely even to have a runner in the race, you know? Because like we were neighbours at home. My father got me good to him and Paddy got me good to him as well. Or we live a hundred yards apart and um, we'd be off. I was always open it as a young fellow, you know, the excitement of ponies and all this carry on with the lads and that was more enticing than say at home farming with cows and things like that, you know, or whatever. But And that was just the way it was. I spent a lot of time in it and done a few summers in it as well, you know, when you were young, like in around the stable and riding out bits and pieces and stuff like that. But it was just great excitement. And if I wanted to go racing, there was no problem himself or Maureen or bring me to Jim Cannes or anything, I just jumped in with the rest of the lads and off we'd go, you know, that kind of a way. Do you know my kids do it like I'm sure you the same yourself when you're young and friendly as well, off to all sorts of shows and Jim Cannes and everything. And, you know, race meetings then progress from that, I suppose. And that's where the, the love for the race and the excitement all started and grew, you know. And basically you've grew you've grown up with obviously Paddy got be good to him, but George, Willie, Tom, Tony, and Sandra, you you know them all your life. You grew up with them, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all all the one, you know what I mean? More or less, you know. So George and I were best friends, still are, you know, what I mean, that's just the way it is. But um, yeah. You know, it's great. I walked into the, pra- into, the, into the parade ring after the race last Sunday and Willie was waiting for me to come up. If he had to have a hurl, I was going to get a slap of it. But anyway, and I wouldn't mean it. He wasn't that good ahead either when he was using one. But um, <laughs> he was as awkward. Oh, you get to, you get the elbow of it or the butt of it maybe, but you wouldn't, you know what I mean? But anyway, he says to me, I've been trying to win this race for years. And says, oh, you may wait another year. <laughs> you like Johnny Logan, what's another year? <laughs> I should look at him. He took it in great spirit, you know. Anyway. And he, he, he had enough about things going on last weekend to keep himself happy anyway, hadn't he? Big time. I'm, <laughs> big time. I'm, and Paul, that, there was footage of you. I was at home the sun on that day. <coughs> and uh, there was footage of you. All you could hear is you and your and whoever's with you roaring the Philly home or the mayor home. I had to, obviously a silent grandstand. How does that compare to... You've trained English Derby Greyhound winners. You've trained Irish Greyhound Derby winners. But to do that on a, a different sport on a bigger stage uh, must have been... It is, it is great, Fran. I'll tell you why. Because say, even with the dogs to win it, now winning the first English Derby was huge because we tried for years and years and years. And to win a Derby in the Greyhound game is a massive event because it doesn't just... It's not all on the day. You have to perform on the day of the final. But, you know, it's a six-week long event that you have to qualify and get through the rounds and... In the Greyhound game, it was our job, you know, it was expected of you to win, you know, near enough. And by the time when we did finally win the derby with JT Jet, who incidentally John Turner owns as well as, as the mayor, heaven help us. But when, and he was tight, I didn't think he was up because he drifted off the bends and that. But anyway, when they called his number, I just said it was amazing relief, really, to win it. Um, but that was excitement on Sunday. That was just a different type of excitement you know winning the derby was a massive thing to do a huge achievement it's like something you strive for all your life and you, and you get there um this is not something i've strived for all my life i can't re- even believe that we have a horse of her caliber here and to win it that, to win that particular race then that was just massive excitement if you know what i mean there is a difference between relief of achieving something that's huge towards just you know excitement of winning something that's that's big as well you know that kind of a way it's probably like winning a derby at your second attempt or something like that, and you, you can't take it all in. But I have 40 years trying to win stuff behind me with the Greyhounds, so I, I, I do understand what it's like to win that race. That opportunity will probably never come again. And, and it doesn't matter. We've done it, and we can we have it on video. And I tell you one thing, she's fairly fit because she's after winning it about 50 times since. <laughs> it's just Joseph's one that would have caught me by now. <laughs> Well, I tell you, Cheers Buddy was the first horse we had to go at, right? The little horse that Martin Lanny and myself owned it. And um, he said to me one evening, well, he was here for the winter, we gelded him as a two-year-old, and he was there. He says to me, why don't you try and train him yourself? And I said to him, you nuts. So anyway, the idea was lying around all 
winter and the excitement of trying something new was massive. Like, you know, it really was a challenge. And we had a go and I said to Tony Mullins, I said, Tony, do you mind if I bring him over and put him around Tony's garden? No, nah, work away. He says, anytime you want. Very obliging how Tony was, you know. So anyway, we used to bring him over and then a chap riding him out for me. And I said, now do what Tony's lads are doing. So they were going around doing maybe one and a half and then back one and a half, right? So we're at this for maybe three or four weeks. And it was a bit tedious to be honest now, but anyway, well, coming back from Tony's with the toolbox, you see, and he was inside it. Well, one or two mornings used to kick the back door. And I said to myself, now, hold on, are you kicking the back door coming back from the gallop? So the next morning I went over, I said, you do an extra lap. There's no point in bringing him home fresher than he was going over. And that's how we kind of went on from there. Just, you know, do your own thing, do a bit more. And then we went to the corridor with him one day and I rang Shami Heffernan and I asked him, will you sit up with him? And Shami up across the old Vic and... He said, that's what I nearly do off of his rating. So he said, don't do it now for about three weeks. Just stay doing what you're doing. And we stayed working him away and went back up in three weeks. He said, you're ready to run now. Now he says, he don't do what they all do, go mad. Ease off, and he said, for the last week or 10 days into his race and freshen him up. And so that was massive advice. Imagine someone like Shamey telling you, and that's what we've done. Entered him in Dundalk on a Friday night. And an old doggy trick, you had you double entered him. We entered him in Dundalk on a Friday and Gordon on a Sunday. And Shamey was suspended for the Friday. So I rang Joseph. I said to him, you mightn't believe it, but I have a horse. Will you ride him for me? And he said he would. And he he won him. He got him up on the line to win the book and done up. And we ran him in Gordon on the Sunday. And Shamey was available. And Shamey rode him and he won again. So you think, like, it was, you know, no problem. I'll tell you one thing. There was an awful lot of days I came home in the race and since wondering what was going on. <laughs> but anyway, that was a great start. And that probably, you know yourself, like, beginner's look or whatever but he was our first horse was that your was he your first runner your first runner was your first winner yeah the first horse I ever ran won and he won again on the Friday or on the Sunday in Gorn and um, I didn't I forgot to declare the five pound penalty I got fined 200 quid <laughs> <laughs> I had to go in before the stewards and they said well done for winning the race, but you're going to get fined 200 quid for not declaring that I go, right, I'll know the next time, but anyway. <laughs> you know? Paul, you must have got some kick out of that, though, because basically, with the greatest respect, your, your dog training career is the business. This is your hobby. That's and it was basically through trial and error. You must have got some... So self-taught really, and you must have got some kick out of that the dog you know, Friday night. With your first winner. Life, and you're watching the horses going zoom up the home straight and all this, right? The first night Cheers Buddy ran, I didn't realize how slowly horses come towards you because he hit the front. Say with about a furlong down, or he was in the front, you know what I mean? The front line. And watching that last furlong seemed like about two hours. I thought he'd never get to the line. You know what I mean? Like. And um, it's amazing when I was watching a race that I was involved in towards watching him, you know, as a casual observer all the time. I couldn't believe how slowly well, he was going anyway, let's say. I thought, do you know what I mean? Like, um, it took him an awful long time to get to the winning line, but that's just because I suppose, you know, he's the horse who trained yourself. Do you ever find that? No. A horse that you'll be involved in and you think he was never he was only crawling. Oh, yeah, definitely. Take them all day to get to the line, especially if they're in front. <laughs> yeah. Uh, You're Paul, for that winning line. Paul, you want to see the things we back on a Friday night and we're going like that across the screen. Right? <laughs> yeah, I had a few of them in my day. <laughs> but that's, that's what slows them down is the weight of money, Fran. You, you only put half your money on them, Fran, you travel a lot easier. <laughs> it's, it's, picking, it's, it, it's picking the right ones, Paul, is the problem. <laughs> you have that whole pin. <laughs> I just tell you one thing, Dundalk is some job. And you know what I know about Dundalk? There was a whole load of young, well, not young lads like me, but inexperienced trainers like me in it. It's the best thing I've seen in, in greyhound racing or horse racing for young trainers to start off with and to have a surface that they need to worry about. You know what I mean? Like, so you don't have to worry about whether your horse is running heavy ground or soft ground, like you do, say, on grass. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, you have a constant surface, you have a constant shape of a track. And you've all the different distances and you've all the different levels. And I think it's massive for a young fella. And I'd say that's why an awful lot of young trainers go to Dundalk. They can all they do is go and do their course and get a license and they can get a horse. And they're not the most expensive horses in the world to have. And a couple of lads can get involved and be able to run up a Friday night and it's great sport. But it is a great learning curve for 
you look at the names of some of them trainers that have come through up there and how well they're doing and all the rest of it and, and they all cut their teeth and done that but an awful lot of them did it's a massive thing for the industry for say for young people that way young jockeys as well there during the winter that wouldn't have got opportunities like years ago when the flat season closed down during the winter you know big time and, it is Jimmy Martin now Jimmy let me in free the next day I go <laughs> <laughs> I know Jimmy on the life so it doesn't matter <laughs> and you'd often you'd often you'd have plenty of runners in Dundalk and the Greyhound side yeah. of things wouldn't you yeah, yeah loads of them I remember even going to Dundalk when it was in grass track that time Tara Vick was running and I think he was second in a big hurdle up there he was at a McCarty's hurdle or something like that run that time Kevin you wouldn't remember that Pat Smullen got to be good to remember that the Carroll's oh, hurdle wasn't it for us he used about, to tell a great story oh, he did gentleman but when I tell you this one now this is how clever a trainer he was right we had first Friday running one night. Now, first Friday was the great row going. Lovely horse, mad about him. But anyway, he was a half brother to heaven help us. But anyway, he had to be in front or he'd say, well, I've enough done now for tonight. And God Almighty wouldn't make him come from behind, you know. But anyway, this night, don't ask me why I got an idea in my head that maybe we'd hold him up. And I was lucky enough to have got Pat through you to ride him for me, right? So we went into the parade before the race. And of course, myself and Martin were up to our study the farm and getting the whole lot and getting involved. And I said, you know, says, well, I'll ask Pat to hold him up and see, can he get him to come from behind, right? So Pat duly did what I asked him to do and the horse finished about fifth. Now he'd have won, I'd say, a furlong had I said nothing, right? But anyway, that was what I, that was my one and only time to be lucky enough to get Pat's one and ride a horse for me. And I was stupid enough to go and issue instructions to him. And I have a great cutting of a paper in there. I should bring it out and show it to you. It's a little cutting of a paper that Lester Pickett is a quote of Lester's. And he said, you should never really give a jockey instructions. He said, because the good ones don't need him and the poor ones can't carry him out anyway. <laughs> it's actually very but, true. No, they should say the same to trainers. Lads that know nothing should shut up. And I should have shut up that night. That'd have been grand. <laughs> anyway, no, there you go. <laughs> And uh, Paul, uh, heaven help us, where are we going to see her next? Please God, in Cheltenham. Yeah, we're going back, that's the friend. John loves to have runners in Cheltenham, um, if it's at all possible. So we have rented in the Coral Hurl. We have rented in the Martin Pipe Conditional Race. We have rented in the County Hurl. And if we don't make any of the handicaps, I also have rented in the Stairs Hurl. <laughs> she, she's definitely going so far. Well, that's the plan, Fran. Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how far will you travel? And, <laughs> and, and, and Paul, wherever she gets in, and she will get in on the back of the last day, wherever you want, I'd say. So, yeah. What, what, what yeah. would it mean to you to, obviously it's not a normal year, but to go to Cheltenham with a runner and a, and a, good, and a good run? We went last year, we ran her into Sun and Lanes. Imagine having a runner in the Sun and Lanes hurl. Like, the Sun and Lanes hurl for me opened the whole meeting. As, as a young flip growing up, I remember meeting classes in school to, Watch Council College win in her Johnny Tracy and Paddy Mullins back in the day in the 70s, right? And you know what? It opened the meeting and it was always a great race for the Irish horses. So it kind of launched the whole meeting. So here we were in the middle of the whole lot last year and it was massive crack. We ran on the Sunday lines because it's a huge race. We're hoping that we get a bit of cut in the ground and we're fairly sure of getting Danny Mullins as well. And she look at it, was a mad race, but um, she finished seventh after getting a lot of hassle in the race. But anyway, she ran a cracker in fairness to her. Um, and it was a great honour. Honest to God, it really was that runner at the festival in Chelton was mad. And then she actually ran well too, which was a big help. You know what I mean? If she ran pulled up or something like that, then you wouldn't be maybe as happy about it. But she did run well, you know, for her, for her anyway. So, and, yeah. and of course, extra satisfaction as well. You actually bred the filly. Sorry? You, extra satisfaction as well, Paul. You, you, you bred the filly as well, heaven help. Yeah, yeah. She's been here since day one. Um, I'll tell you another clever thing we done with her. I entered her in the sales as a three-year-old when she was a two-year-old. I didn't realise they looked at her passport. <laughs> no idea, Kevin. Honest to God, dumb and dumber now. They wouldn't do this any better than what we do. And there's people probably watching this that do everything by the letter of the law and says, how in the name of God is that mayor running with that clown trend? But there you go. Queer things happen, I tell you, around the year times. But we did, yeah, we bred her, we've had her from the start. And um, and she's grand. She's nearly an old pet, but now she's competitive pet, you know what I mean? She likes things her way and 
you know. Um, but now it is easy to be nice to her because she is a nice kind of a mare, you know. She's not sour or she's not bitter or anything like that at all, you know. She's she wouldn't kick you now or anything like that, you know what I mean? You'd be safe around her and stuff like that. So it is easy to get on with her, like, you know, as long as we do things her way. She's a bit like my wife, you know what I mean? Something similar, like. <laughs> <laughs> she's all right around the place too obviously. oh yeah oh yeah and as long as she gets her way everything is happy we have a saying here at the house this house if mama ain't happy ain't nobody happy <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit of advice for you younger lads I think we can all vouch for that Fran can't we happy wife happy life is there to say <laughs> that's it. Yeah, the sooner you learn that the better <laughs> <laughs> and Paul, heaven help her. She's only one of two horses you train, is that right? Just three, actually. I told us my life. There's three of them there freaking around at the moment. Uh, Recite a prayer and another horse then that came back from England and we weren't trying to bring him out. Now. But I'd say he'd be a bit of decent ground. He'd want more so than that and else. Now, that's what I think anyway, you know. That's and you still got the Tony's gallop or have you no, put have in our own gallop now? We, we, we put in our own gallop here at the, at the house. Um, just a little bit over two furlongs, like in a circle, you know. So you just go around it often enough until you get dizzy or fall down one or the other. <laughs> but you do, yeah, no, Scran, and look at the great axes. We're in a great area here. The Ninga gallops, German Mullins gallops are running five minutes over the road, or sometimes we go to um, Michelle Gannon there in Spa Hill. Look, beautiful gallop, you know, they have the wood chip and the grass gallop up the hill, and that's an amazing place to bring a horse because. You can't erupt the hill up to the top, but you're up really high. But have a, it takes about 10 minutes to walk back down again. And I think it's fantastic for a horse's head. You know, they're totally relaxed and lovely scenery up there. If you look back the way, if you look out the way, you're looking into Tipperary, which is not so nice. But if you look kind of to the side, you can see the rest of the Kenny and Leash, which is not too bad. <laughs> and but Paul. Sorry, Kevin. Sorry. Go on, go on, go on. I, I was just saying on the Gallops, Gallops team, you're telling us off before we came on air. The horse walkers that you had a greyhound walker and the local manufacturer actually got a bit, bit of in, inspiration from your design or what you had originally. Well, when we started out, it was, well, you couldn't walk the dogs with the number of body we had here anyway, up and down the main road. You know, it was just it was just too dangerous. And um, well, I was watching a program one night where a lad rode his horse into town and he jumped off him and clipped him onto a for all the world like a clothesline going around in a circle. And um, I said, that's the exact idea I wanted for a, a Greyhound Walker. And we went off and got the parts to put it together. And brother of mine is mechanically minded in that, and he helped me with it. And we designed this walker that had a central gearbox and a central axle, and all the dogs walked around it in the circles, and they were happy out. And um, I recommended it to a few of the guys that were involved in the horses that a walker would be very handy for sort of pre train and exercise, you know what I mean, just to loosen them up. And Jerry Brennan got me good to him that designed the Brennan walkers. Um, Jerry came over, you know, he'd be a neighbour anyway, but he came over to look at what we were doing. And I don't know if he got inspiration from that, but um, he designed all those walkers. But we had a, a big walker here that used to walk 20 greyhounds at a time, and we converted that back to a six horse walker now. So that walks the horses instead of walking the we, we, we have other dog walkers that walk the dog still, but that big one, I converted it into a horse walker. So basically, you were ahead of your time, uh, Paul. You, you had, you had a, a, a dog walker before horse walkers came on scene. Well, before a lot of them anyway. But like, I mean, I wouldn't say it was ahead of your time. It was probably lazy, Kevin. I just didn't like walking dogs up and down the road. And I needed a way to do it. I was able to do the rest of it, the gallop and then all the rest of it. But it was the mother of, in, of you know, necessity. I needed something to walk the dogs rather than me going up and down the road the whole time. Like, you know what I mean? So that was really all it was. And when I saw this thing on the TV, I said, no, that might suit me the finest. And uh, it went on from there and it worked. The dogs were fine. We still used them there. They get on them every morning for a half an hour there and then they get, say, if they were doing any trials or galloping and we'd work them on that and back to the walkers in the evenings again. And, you know, the results speak for themselves and they work the finest, you know. How long are you training Greyhounds now? Um, 1984, I think it was my first winner for myself. Yeah, 1984. How many years ago was that? 38. 36 or 7, I knew, yeah. 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 
So that's it. I go to bed. And then I had my first play home was when I was a young fellow, was 17. That's a long time ago. That's a good bit further back now. But um, and she won a race. I was uh, a neighbor of mine, Jimmy Wall, trained her for me. And um, I remember her winning in Kilkenny one night. And I walked in to watch the race. And next to the George Wallace was with me. And uh, he had been into track a few times in Kilkenny. I hadn't, actually, funny enough. And um, they put in the traps anyway, the traps open and zzz, around and then going, what? And that was it, like, you know, I said, no commentary, nothing. You know, I was used to going to horse racing sort of thing, expecting a commentary now and listen, the dog race was over in a flash. And it was amazing. It didn't really bite, the bug didn't bite. It was actually when I was finishing um, a course as a farm manager in County Mead, and I decided to get another dog. And I rang a fellow that was involved in the dogs up there and he gave me a man's number. And I gave the dog to him to train. And he's my father-in-law. Well, God, we go to him now, Benny Kavanagh. But it was when I saw Benny feeding the dogs and how he could control their food, you know what I mean? Say it was so much, say, meat or bread or whatever you were giving them or chicken or vegetables or whatever. That amazed me because I just took it for granted that every dog was fed the same as the sheep dogs at home in the yard. You know what I mean? I didn't think there was any thing as a, a racing diet for them. And when I could see the way the different ways that he fed them and how it improved your fitness just by having a better diet, that kind of caught my imagination and it went on from there then, you know. And Paul, I know we, we're slagging you. Well, well, we're not slagging you, but we have said it in the past that you are the Willie Mullins, Aidan O'Brien, Gordon Elliott, you know, Henry de Bromhead of the uh, of the dog racing world in a serious matter. You've won everything that can be won and some of those races on numerous occasions. Well, look, those men are brilliant men and all in their own field. And, and like, there's a whole world of people that never really, they work very, very hard to try and achieve the same as what all those men you mentioned. And, you know, they don't get the breaks. Well, we were lucky. We, we got a great team of different greyhounds that came away and there always did seem to be a good one here and some very exceptional ones came our way, you know, in fairness. And in fairness, Kevin, those better ones, there was umpteen times, I remember the first champion stakes we won with a dog called Trade Union. <clears throat> and it's a bit like the mayor on last Sunday, all through the week, I was reasonably bullish or confident, whatever you want to call it, if this dog done everything right. But by the time I got to the race, I remember watching that race live in Shelburne Park when the hair started, when the bell rang for the hair to move, my knees started shaking. I was in with Matt Travers, Matt O'Donnell, you know, um, Brendan Mullen, all these, Francie Murray, you know, all these established men. And here was I, a young fellow in the middle of them all. I said, how could, I could, no chance. But the, the traps opened and Ernie was, uh, what was his pet name? He's gone boom, out and gone and, and won and held on as well. It was very, very much like the race last Sunday. He was getting caught coming home too, but he held on and won. But, and that was it, you know, you just come across, he was a great dog, a great starter, and, you know, and that gets your confidence then that what you're doing is okay. I find the biggest thing about training, and I've often said it to different people, get a blueprint, get down something that works, you know, get a, a, a system or a, a routine, should I say, is probably even better for animals, and sticking to a routine is huge with any, anyone will tell you that deal with animals, why don't you do the same thing every time the same day with them, they're happy then to know what they expect, and if you start to have a, a training regime, no matter what it is, there's a whole lot of different ways of people train greyhounds. I train them one way, other people will train them another way, but they still might get the same results. But if you get, I find that if you have something that works, stick with it. Okay, you can vary it slightly, but stick with it because their form might dip and their form will come back. And, uh, you know, there's no real reason for it, maybe, but if you keep changing what you're doing, you'll have no idea where you're at with it. You know what I mean? But Paul, you like the lads in the, the, the horse trainers equivalent. Uh, you built it up from scratch, like all the lads have mentioned it from. You started off from scratch. You got those good dogs because you were getting results and people then were attracted to send you dogs. So obviously you had a great uh, intuition for training dogs and you were getting the results. Hence you built up and got all the success. Yeah, but a lot of it can happen by accident. Now, and that's the truth. It's like, as I say, refer back to that many things working out. I remember when we started training greyhounds, where I was training them at home in the home place, Michael English, who was still with me, Michael was only maybe 13 at the time, He his house was just, say, where the farmyard was, was a big field. And Michael's house was at the other end of the field from where 
the house was, for the, for the farmyard was, right? And we had a few dogs in, in, the, in the kennels in the farmyard. And every morning at whatever time, half seven or eight o'clock, Michael would come out across and walk out across the field. I'd open the gate and the dogs would fly down to him. Now, the ground would want to be soft sort of January, February, March. Do you know what I mean? April, when the ground would get drier, firm then in May, June, July and August, you were finished doing that because the ground would be gone too hard. But you used to go down for a gallop and back up. You know what I mean? Straight out of the kennel, first thing in the morning, boom, gone. And that was maybe doing 600, 800 yards every day, right? And in, in, a, in a little treadmill, little two-dog walker. But in January, February and March, maybe into April, we would win probably, you know, half the races we would win in the year in those first few months. And there were so fit dogs that were able to run over 525 and win in 550s and 575s. And it was purely down to that amount of exercise, you know what I mean? Like free running. And we brought that into, into when we moved up here and bought here, I put down a gallop that allowed me then an all weather gallop that allowed me to exercise the dogs that much. Do you know what I mean? That the old way, like God be good to my father-in-law, Benny Cavanagh, his way was your dog safely ran on a Saturday. Well, you'd walk on Monday, Tuesday, give him a gallop on Wednesday, walk on Thursday and Friday, now twice a day walking, and you'd run him again on the Saturday. We kind of done the opposite. We walked the whole place as a, as a kind of a loose and up exercise, but we got up to him on a Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and ran him on a Saturday. And that's what we done and still do, you know. Um, and yeah. how far how far would the gallop be? Uh... Our gallop, we put in, oh. Tom Curlin put in a, a gallop for me, Tom that does the horse gallops, again, at the home place, and it's it's um, nearly three, at least three furlongs, yeah. Now, that's very long for a dog gallop. Most dog gallops are 300 yards long. That one is 600 yards long. But the theory behind that is we don't put a drag on around. I just whistle them. Now you're trying to get a front runner to come up and you drop the other ones behind them, right? And that's the way we do with the greyhounds. That if you, some dogs are great to come to the whistle and they'll fly up and you drop the lazier ones behind them or the ones that you want to make work harder behind them to catch up. And um, the theory behind it is that they're working, say, if you put them behind the lure, they'll definitely try harder. But I don't really want them to do that in exercise. I just want them to sort of work for a less intensity over a longer period of time. And that way, I think you'll end up with a stronger, fitter animal. You know what I mean? That you're not forcing them the whole time to do anything. They're kind of doing it at their own free will, but they'll do it because it's their natural instinct to chase. They'll chase the lad that's gone up in front of them anyway. You know. Um, and Paul, a dog that uh, a lot of the Irish viewers would would uh, resonate with, of course, was Late Late Show. Of course, Pat Kenny, who was the host of the Late Late Show at the time, yeah. he, had yeah. that, he had that dog in training with you. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that was the look of it. Like, we had, a, you know, he was just a superstar. He really, really, he was the most balanced, perfect animal. He was incredible. He never got bumped on a bend. He could go down to a bend and he just, you know, he just had something else that no other dog I've ever trained had. You know, whether it was vision to see something, but he just glided around the tracks. He was amazing. Um, we brought him to Cork one night, actually. It was a big night in Cork. Um, the late Joe Walsh, God we go to the minister, then minister for agriculture, was having a big night. You know, it could have been even a Laurel's final night. And we brought him down um, as a, you know, just to parade him for the people to see. He had a huge draw on him that time. By the young fella that night parading him for me, I don't know, can, can I put up a picture that you might be able to see? You tell me if you can see it now, or if it, that way, can you see it? Make out a fellow with glasses there, Paul. Yeah, there's a fellow that, he was holding the dog that night. Now, I think he went down to train horses afterwards. I'm, I, I'm not sure. He doesn't, he, doesn't do, uh, he doesn't do a bad old job there down near Rose Green and Bally Dial, is it, Ed? Is it? He might, yeah, he might, yeah. <laughs> and he's he's not a bad old trader, is he? He said, yeah, he went off training horses, I think, anyway, or something. And the last I heard, he was training horses. We're going to try it anyway and see how that goes. How is see? that working out for him, Paul? <laughs> yeah, there you go. And all he wanted to know, all he wanted to know that night was, see, how did he get the shine on the dog? <laughs> That's what he kept saying to me. He said, how did he get that shine on him? I said, I don't know. I'll just feed him, and that's it. You know. Anyway. And of course, yeah, yeah, Aidan was involved with the dog as well, wasn't he? That's when I met you, of course. The pup down go, a bitch called Clusheen, I think was her name. And she won. She won a race or two, yeah. But I like, they wouldn't have time, do you know what I mean? Like, 
interest, I suppose, the county caller crush in after a great mare of Joe Crowley, gotta be good to Joe, that he trained. And she was a great mare. Jeez, I remember she won a load of races. I think Paddy Mullins might have ended up buying her off. And, you know, nice. maybe they might, I could stand corrected, but I think they did. But she was a great little mare, yeah, the Joe trained. You, know, you wouldn't find too much after Joe now, Kevin, she wouldn't. Time wise. No. If no, you definitely dog, not. You buy the dog off, man, you tell you that for nothing. <laughs> did you do the trainer's course at Joe Crowley, did you? No. So Joe Crowley wouldn't have had to do the trainer's course, would he? He did. I thought I thought yeah. you were on the same trainer's course. No, no. Um, a couple of right lads with me now. We were fair old Paddy Tomey. Come on, Paddy. Yeah, Ross O'Sullivan. Damien English. Uh, Martin Hassett. I tell you, by the way, we were the A team. Oh, lads, yeah. And uh, what do you call him? Came in for a day. Oh, jeez, he told us a story. I laughed. Brendan, do you know Brendan? He trains a couple of horses there with Jim Bulger. Kind of joke. Kind of joke. Oh, geez, <coughs> you know, if he ever decides to pack up the horses, he'd make a great storyteller or a comedian. He was brilliant. Oh, we've got some laugh over Brendan, yeah. She's stopped the lights. But that's, they, were all, they were all on that group that we were in that time. They've done well, you know. They have indeed. They have indeed. Yeah, Paddy Toomey's doing really well. Ross O'Sullivan's yeah, doing well Damien, as well. Damien started out that time in Dundalk. And Ross, right. Ross winning away there. And Paul, is there another, is there another generation? I wonder would we be the best bunch that ever went through race? We'll have to find that out, will we? Right. Check your picture up at the wall there, Paul. <laughs> it's definitely gone up out the heaven help us one anyway, Fran. Yeah, it definitely. And Paul, is there is there any little heaven help us coming through? Is there any siblings coming through? Yeah, we have our sister, a mare called Die Will Be Done. And Tony won a, a winner's hurdle for me on her above in Punchestown one day. And I have um, a two-year-old out of her by policymaker. Peter Maris horse. You know the side of Shakan Porswa? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, and then we had a Yates fall over this year, Paul, and we sold them in the sales. And she's in fall to Yates. Now she's due in about three weeks' time to Yates again. So you never know. I should have it. Lightning struck anyway, friend. You know, there's no guarantee it's going to strike twice, but it struck once and that'll do me, you know. Or would you would you like to expand on the trend or just keep it as a bit of a hobby? Know, it's it's three, Paul. No, I'd sooner just keep it country and keep it happy. And you know, Nile Prendergast helps me there, he's a great chap. And if we can try and get something now that I run the bumper there and get Nile and I would win her again, it'd be great. You know what I mean? He's a wonderful fella. Come in there and help me the whole time. And you know, he's been unlucky, he hooked his arm there in a pint of pint this year, but now the pint of pints are called off. But and he's mad to get going at it, like you know. But no, I don't want to do the big numbers thing again, Kevin. I did all that with the rounds and I couldn't face that numbers game again. No, I'd, I'd sooner just keep it, you know. We're busy, like, but I just don't want to be doing the running around like a foxy ass bee again. You know, I've done that. Paul, do you, do you find a, a, a release to train a horse for away from the Greyhounds day job? Is, is that your playing golf visitor? Is that your. It, it, you know what I mean? It's a, that it's kind a, of a... It's a new challenge and it's lovely, but I'll tell you something for nothing. When your horse comes under pressure in a race and the jockey starts pushing, right, grand like a horse, you stay going, but when the horse stops, that absolutely empties me. I just cannot, I don't know, I can't figure it out. I, I, I want the answer to about 500 questions all in the next five minutes. And, you know, I, I've known to turn to, you just have to try and come home with it or ring Martin Lanny on the way home. And spin it out time and time again and try and stumble across a reason, like you know. But anyway, that is part of it, I'm sure. But that is a massive um you couldn't call it a downer because it's part of the game, you know. But when your horse comes under pressure and the jockey just goes zoom, out the picture of that door, oh that is because you know 99.9% of my dogs don't do that, but then I suppose look. I've had a lifetime training them. Some of them do, but not very, very rarely, you know. But a little bit oftener than rarely, my horses do that. <laughs> you know? You're obviously a naturally competitive uh, 
individual anyway and you want to win so when they're on you, you question yourself like. you know if you could be competitive it's great isn't it like you know what i mean that at least you know the competitive but um when they come in and you're scratching your head and you know, like, willie took a picture of me one day about in punches town scratching me head like this after having help us around the bumper and i was trying to figure it out he sent it to john turner he said your trainer's under pressure <laughs> Actually, I should have took a picture of Willie the other day and after we won in the race above and sent it in reverse. I never thought of it. I'll have to, I'll have to do it the next day. Chel- Cheltenham, Paul. You can do it in Cheltenham. <laughs> and yourself and John Turner, of course, you go back many, many years, don't you? Yes, yeah, yeah. We have a good old friends, like, and, um, you know, he wanted to get involved in the horses a bit more. And I said to him, he's... His dream, I suppose, any owner is to run in Cheltenham or even to have a winner in Cheltenham. And I just said to him, look, if you want to go down that route, I said, Willie Mullins is there and I'll introduce you and you'd be grand. And he, that's the one thing great about Willie. He trains the horses and whatever way they work out, they work out. You know what I mean? And um, he does his best for anyone that has a horse in the yard. So and they're a great team, aren't they? Like, you know what I mean? In fairness, the, the backup team he has with Patrick and... Ruby and you know Paul Townend and David Casey, you know, and them are it's a great outfit altogether, you know. But your horse will get a chance in Willie's, I know, because I've had one over there over the years on and off too, you know, and it's the same active as anyone else, so fair play to him. <laughs>